We are following reports of power outages in Ukraine this morning as Russia continues its attack on the country. The war reaches its nine-month mark this week. Technology such as drones are aiding Ukrainian forces on the battlefield. Our Chris Livesay met with a reconnaissance unit on the front lines for a rare look at how drones are being deployed. If this is a war between David and Goliath, then this is David's sling. Vastly outnumbered and outgunned by Russia, Ukraine has assembled an army of drones. They're precise and nimble, just like the crack team that literally pulled us through the mud to their secret launch site. I have already got a few calls uh, asking uh, what sector are we going to cover today with our reconnaissance because everyone is interested to get some information. And they're counting on you. And they're counting on us. Counting on them to fly over enemy lines as the eyes of the artillery. You locate the target and then they decide if and when they're going to strike. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I would say that this war is a drone war. A war Russia is fighting dirty firing self-destructing drones into populated areas. Ukraine responded by sea, penetrating deep into Russia's port in Crimea with boat drones. Underdog victories, often aided by volunteers like our escort, Army SOS. Without motivated people, I don't think we, we would have any success. To me, that seems like the one resource that has been so underestimated in Ukraine, motivation. Yeah, it has been underestimated by Putin, I believe. Underestimated by Putin, even the rest of the world, but never by Ukraine. Chris Livesay on the front line in eastern Ukraine. With us now is uh, Ali Neunin, who is a distinguished fellow with the 38 North Korea program at the Stimson Center. He's also a former deputy director general of the International Atomic energy agency. Uh, so as you know, roughly half of Ukraine's energy infrastructure has either been damaged or destroyed in the war. So what kind of challenges does this present for the Ukrainian people as winter sets in? I think several uh, problems will arise during this winter. First of all, thank you for having me here. So first is certainly the whole civilian infrastructure. It's going to be dark and cold. Supply networks don't work properly. So there are a lot of hardships, and that's why many of the citizens have already left Ukraine. There's a tremendous refugee problem growing in, in Eastern Europe. That's where they go first. But then at the same time, this is a playing with fire. We have heard it during last week and again, a shelling of the nuclear power plant in Saborozhye. In a worst case, this may interrupt the safe operation of the reactor. As a result of that, the cooling system of the reactor fails, which results then melting of the fuel and releasing of radioactivity, not only in the premises of the reactor, but in the neighborhood and even wider. So this is really a matter of great concern. So just to follow up on what you were just talking about, both Russia and Ukraine are blaming each other for shelling the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. How dangerous is the situation there? It is very dangerous. Because if this reactor cannot properly cool, the fuel will melt. It could even become a small explosion, which then releases the radioactivity. And these are huge amounts of radioactivity which go to the environment. But even without that, once there is a shelling, some other vital parts of the nuclear power plant may be compromised. Or very simple, the workers who have now been working nine months under stress are not able to cope with all the situations which are there. So that's why it is important to get this uh, military exclusion zone there so that the reactors can be maintained in a shutdown status and in a safe uh, condition. So let's turn to Iran now. The country says it has begun producing uranium enriched to 60% purity at its underground Fordo nuclear facility. Uh, what was this move in response to, and what might it indicate about Iran's nuclear capabilities? First of all, this is tit for that. Uh, IAEA photo governors adopted a resolution last week that Iran should address some of the old uh, uh, experiments which it has done with uh, uranium. There seems to be undeclared uranium in Iran which is a violation of its undertakings under the safeguards agreement. 
Iran is in reality in non-compliance with its safeguards obligations. Iran is not happy about it. They want another solution. They claim that this is a, not a true situation. These documents are falsified. On the other hand, there is a very hard evidence that these are true, that these experiments took place. And the question is, where is that uranium? And where are those equipment which were used for these experiments? Because this program was to develop nuclear weapons. This was not for the civilian cause. And then that raises then the other question. So why does Iran now produce 60% enriched uranium? There is no uh, civilian need in Iran's nuclear program for that enrichment. And 60%, you are very close to the weapons grade uranium, which is uh, 90%. In a couple of weeks' time, they can, with the current uh, re, uh, enrichment, uh, uh, centrifuge enrichment plants, produce enough n nuclear weapons grade material for maybe for three nuclear weapons. That's a lot. So therefore, there's no reason to increase the stock of 60% enriched uranium. But Iran has now weaponized this enrichment capability and tries to pursue the international community that those old experiments get forgotten, that Iran was working with the nuclear weapons. And the question is still, where are the equipment? Are they being used? And who is working with them? Uh, concerning developments, and as you point out, a lot of open questions right now. Ali Hainonen, thank you very much, Ali, for sharing your insight with us. Thank you.